Male bravado and aggression, predominantly in the form of street fighting, permeate Romeo and Juliet from the very start. Although the play is set in 14th century Italy, it does in fact reflect Elizabethan England's rules about and attitudes towards violence. During the time the play was written, male aggression was a part of everyday life. Men were expected to be violent, from defending their home and honour to being physically involved in the arresting of felons as there was no police force at this time. While male violence may have been expected, however, it was by no means approved of, and the punishment for murder was execution. The use of arms against someone was a crime, unless the accused was able to provide a justification for their actions. The concept of manslaughter had been introduced some hundred or so years earlier, where sudden anger and intense provocation were allowed as mitigating factors and might persuade a court to acquit the accused if they could prove that the attack was not premeditated. The prologue warns us that Verona is in a very febrile state, where two households both alike in dignity from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. The feud between the Capulets and the Montagues goes so far back and is so deep-seated that it infects all levels of society, from the heads of each house down to their servants, and the language of conflict, be it verbal or physical, dominates. This is a society where problems are settled with male aggression rather than with conciliation. When Samson and Gregory, two servants of the House of Capulet, enter at the beginning of Act 1, Scene 1, not only are they both armed with swords and bucklers, or small shields, but Samson's very first words also communicate this sense of belligerence. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. To carry coals was a contemporary slang term and means that they will not stand for being insulted. This assertion reveals that the men are already in a heightened state of anticipation of conflict, and are ready to take offence, and to retaliate, at the slightest provocation. Shakespeare uses the banter and wordplay between the two men here, not only to demonstrate the extent of the antipathy between the two houses, as Samson contemptuously declares in response to Gregory's teasing that he has not quickly moved to strike, that a dog of the house of Montague moves me but also to show that their behaviour is characterised by male bravado and swagger. Bravado is an appearance of courage or confidence that someone puts on in order to impress or intimidate others. Gregory, when he plays on the meaning of the verb to move, successfully goads Samson by questioning his masculinity, suggesting that he might run away in the face of a challenge. For Samson, of course, the verb to move means to be motivated, while Gregory uses it to mean the opposite of standing your ground and hints that he may be a coward. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runst away. The edginess underlying this banter reveals the high value put in this society on aggression as evidence of masculinity the consequent dishonour of turning away from a fight, and the fine line that there is between verbal sparring and physical fighting. As Samson is taunted further by Gregory, who persists in twisting his words in order to tease him, we can also see that, in this society, male aggression is inextricably linked with sexual violence. Samson declares that, I will take the wall of any man or maid of Montagues. In Elizabethan England, walking near the wall was both cleaner and safer than in the middle of the street, and was therefore a luxury enjoyed by those of higher status. So Samson means that he will show himself to be better than the Montagues. Gregory, however, takes the opportunity to once more challenge Samson's strength by alluding to a proverb which means that the weakest yield in a struggle, when he says, That shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. 
Samson quickly retaliates with, "'Tis true, and therefore women, being the weaker vessels, are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore I will push Montague's men from the wall and thrust his maids to the wall." Note how Samson says that women are the weaker vessels. In the patriarchal society of the Elizabethan era, women were not only considered inferior to and weaker than men, but were also the legal property of either their father, their brother or their husband. So not only will Samson show his physical superiority over the Montague men by pushing them away from the wall, but he will further insult them by raping their women and, as a result, damaging their property. When Gregory reminds Samson that the quarrel is between our masters and us their men, i.e. that the women should be left out of it, he is dismissive, indicating that he views all Montagues the same, regardless of gender. "'Tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be civil with the maids.' I will cut off their heads. Elaborating, the heads of the maids or their maiden heads, take it in what sense thou wilt. This interchangeability of the threat to decapitate them or to take their virginities through force suggests that no differentiation is made between physical and sexual violence and rape is not considered a heinous crime. Indeed, the very talk of raping women seems to have aroused Samson sexually, as the banter seamlessly switches to talk of male virility, and, in a vulgar image, he boasts about how well he is endowed. Me they shall feel while I am able to stand, and tis known that I am a pretty piece of flesh. At the sight of the Montagues, this phallic imagery continues as he says to Gregory, My naked weapon is out. Quarrel. I will back thee. In other words, his sword is unsheathed, but his choice of language also alludes to the metaphorical exposure of his genitalia. His action also reveals an element of risk-taking, as to unsheath a sword before being provoked demonstrates premeditation and could result in a murder charge. The entrance of Abram and Balthazar from the House of Montague is an opportunity for the pair to put their money where their mouth is. Samson and Gregory are clearly itching for a fight, but for all their swagger, they have to proceed with caution, as the law will come down on them very heavily if they are seen to initiate a brawl. Samson advises Gregory, Let us take the law of our sides, let them begin. Small acts of defiance, such as biting their thumbs and disingenuous leading questions, in order to manufacture an excuse for retaliation, such as this exchange. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. But if you do, sir, I am for you. Are a catalyst for the physical violence which ensues. Note the short sentences in this part of the scene creating a duel of words where the repetition mimics the cut and thrust of the swords. Note also the exaggerated politeness of the repeated sir here, which is meant contemptuously. Abram's declaration, you lie, in response to Samson's claim that his master is better, would have been sufficient provocation to justify physical violence, as this would have amounted to an attack on his honour. It is at this point that Shakespeare introduces both Benvolio of the House of Montague and Tybalt of the House of Capulet. Benvolio's dramatic function is to provide a foil for Tybalt and later for Mercutio. Foils are characters who, although sharing some similarities, contrast and highlight certain other attributes. Both Benvolio and Tybalt, for example, are cousins to the main characters. Both support their families and both behave according to type. Benvolio, whose name in Italian means goodwill, is, however, a calm peacemaker. Opposed to male aggression, he is able to see the bigger picture. Tybalt, who is an impulsive warmonger, is his polar opposite. Quick to anger, he is intent on keeping the feud between the two families alive at whatever the cost. 
When Benvolio enters, rather than join in the brawl, he uses his sword instead to try to stop the servants fighting. Part fools, put up your swords. You know not what you do. Tybalt's first couple of speeches as he enters hot on the heels of Benvolio pretty much sum up his character and his attitudes. He challenges Benvolio. What? Art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon thy death. For him, the death of his enemy is his first recourse rather than his last resort. When Benvolio strikes a conciliatory tone and tries to reason with him, encouraging him to work with him instead of against him to bring the brawl to an end, he is brutally rebuffed. What? Drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues and thee. Have at thee, coward. Peace is clearly anathema to him, as he links his hatred of it with hell, all Montagues and Benvolio himself. Indeed, Tybalt seems to thrive on aggression. His raison d'etre appears to be keeping the feud alive. He does not fight in order to bring peace, but he fights for fighting's sake. He only appears in three scenes in the whole play, but he is angry and spoiling for a fight in all of them. Even the elderly Lords Capulet and Montague, who should know better, are dragged into the brawl. Old habits die hard as Capulet ridiculously calls for his longsword, an old-fashioned and very heavy weapon, to be brought, and Montague struggles to break free from his wife. Thou villain Capulet, hold me not, let me go. Note the difference between the aggressive behaviour of the men here and the pacifying behaviour of their wives. In response to Lord Capulet's calling for his sword, Lady Capulet responds, A crutch, a crutch, why call you for a sword? And in response to Lord Montague, Lady Montague answers him, Thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Both men are presented as ill-equipped for fighting, be it due to their weapons or their age, and yet, in the heat of the moment, they can still be inspired to violence. Fortunately, Prince Aeschylus arrives on the scene to break up the brawl. This time no one is hurt, but Shakespeare has successfully established the volatile atmosphere in which grievances are dealt with through male aggression. We are left with a sense of foreboding that the next time this happens, it will be much more serious. Out of the heat of the brawl, and after a sobering audience with Prince Aeschylus, however, Lord Capulet is much more sanguine when he realises that Romeo has gatecrashed his banquet. This contrasts with the fiery Tybalt who takes Romeo's mere presence there as a personal insult. It is enough to recognise Romeo's voice for him to demand his weapon. This, by his voice, should be on Montague. Fetch me my rapier, boy. What dares the slave come hither in antic face to fleer and scorn at our solemnity? Now, by the stock and honour of my kin, to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. This short speech demonstrates how little it takes to incite Tybalt to violence as he is prepared to end Romeo's life just for turning up at the banquet uninvited. A rapier was smaller, thinner, faster and more precise than a sword, and was designed to inflict wounds to the inside of the body, rather than to the outside as with the sword. It was an urban weapon, rather than one that would be used on the battlefield, and would have been used in what was the developing discipline of fencing. The fact that Romeo has turned up in costume as part of a masquerade, he assumes is meant as mockery, which he intends to punish with death. Lord Capulet, however, demands that Tybalt must put up with Romeo at the party and warns him against causing trouble. He shall be endured. What, Goodman boy, I say he shall go too. Am I the master here, or you? Go too. You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. You'll set cock-a-hoop. You'll be the man. 
In order to remind Tybalt, who is in charge, Lord Capulet repeatedly belittles him by attacking his masculinity. He calls him here a goodman boy, or a child who has forgotten their manners. And a few lines later, both a saucy boy and a princox, or a conceited and insolent fop. Being censured by Lord Capulet in this way, only inflames Tybalt's aggressive nature the more, as not only has he effectively been stripped of his manhood, but he is also forced into doing what does not come naturally, i.e. putting a lid on his anger. Patience perforce with willful collar meeting makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I will withdraw, but this intrusion shall now seeming sweet convert to bitterest gall. Note the way in which Tybalt's unaccustomed self-restraint here has a physical effect on him. Instead of being able to let his anger dissipate, though, he will remove himself for the time being. What seems sweet now, i.e. Romeo's intrusion on their banquet, however, will turn into the bitterest gall, or poison, as he will get his revenge at a later date, when his uncle is not reigning in his behaviour. Note Tybalt's speech here in rhyming couplets, which not only highlights the deadly significance of his words, but the constraints of which also indicate how he is forcing himself not to act on his instincts. We find out in Act 2, Scene 4, in a conversation between Benvolio and Mercutio, that Tybalt's solution is to send a challenge to Romeo for a duel, which Romeo fails to receive as he has spent the night with Juliet. Benvolio in this exchange is confident that Romeo will accept the challenge as to fail to do so would be dishonourable. Nay, he will answer the letter's master, how he dares, being dared. In this scene we also see Tybalt mocked yet secretly admired for his prowess with a sword. Mercutio describes him as more than prince of cats. Here Mercutio is referring to a character from a French fable a cat named Thibault, who was also very quarrelsome. He continues, Oh, he's the courageous captain of compliments. Even though he admits that he is an expert in the art of duelling, note the -the over-the-top alliteration here of courageous captain and compliments, which adds to the sense of mockery. He likens the way Tybalt fights to the way others sight-read music. He fights as you sing Pricksong, keeps time, distance and proportion. He rests his minim rests, one, two, and the third in your bosom. In other words, Tybalt's fighting is textbook perfect. The climax of the play, and its inexorable movement towards tragedy, comes of course in Act 3, Scene 1, when male aggression in the defence of family honour leads to the murders of both Mercutio and Tybalt. Benvolio, now a foil to Mercutio and ever the peacemaker, is concerned that they should go home, as the day is hot, the capels are abroad, and if we meet we shall not scape a brawl, for now these hot days is the mad blood stirring. Mercutio, as his name suggests, is mercurial, or unpredictable, in character. Benvolio knows that the heat of the day inflames tensions, and the testosterone fueled Mercutio is likely to contribute to a brawl, given half the chance. Indeed, when the pair come across Tybalt, Mercutio does his best to provoke him. When Tybalt engages them in conversation in order to ascertain Romeo's whereabouts, he responds, Here's my fiddlestick, meaning his sword, here's that shall make you dance. Tybalt, however, avoids confrontation with Mercutio who is not only his social superior, but is also related to Prince Aeschylus. Not only is this a reflection of the social hierarchy in Verona, but it also demonstrates how Tybalt is single-mindedly pursuing Romeo. Mercutio is an unwelcome distraction. Benvolio tries once more to broker peace, concerned that this confrontation is taking place in public, putting them at risk of arrest. We talk here in the public haunt of men. Either withdraw unto some private place, or reason coldly of your grievances, or else depart. Here all eyes gaze on us. 
When Romeo enters, Tybalt has no more use for Mercutio and Benvolio, declaring, Well, peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. Peace is an interesting word choice here, as we already know Tybalt's opinions on it. When Romeo, ignorant of the challenge, is addressed by Tybalt, he tries to diffuse his aggression by taking a conciliatory tone. I do protest I never injured thee. Mercutio, however, cannot understand why Romeo is unwilling not only to defend his honour, but also his masculinity, and is outraged at this. O oh, calm, dishonourable, vile submission! He takes matters into his own hands and draws his sword on Tybalt. In the ensuing fight, as Romeo desperately tries to enlist Benvolio to help him act as peacemaker, draw Benvolio, beat down their weapons. Gentlemen, for shame forbear this outrage. Tybalt, Mercutio, the prince expressly hath forbid this bandying in Verona's streets. Mercutio is killed by Tybalt, and this murder is the turning point. It is the first death, as up until now, violence has only been threatened. Mercutio is dead, but on Romeo's account, and he in turn is now honour bound to challenge Tybalt. Romeo can no longer attempt to rise above the feud. This gentleman, the prince's near ally, my very friend, hath got his mortal hurt in my behalf. My reputation stained with Tybalt's slander. Tybalt, that an hour hath been my cousin. O oh, sweet Juliet, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper soften valour's steel. Here he complains that his love for Juliet has effectively emasculated him, weakening the steely courage of his disposition and removing his aggression. When Tybalt returns, Romeo is a changed man proclaiming, Away to heaven, respective lenity, and far-eyed fury be my conduct now. He has re-embraced his aggression and the subsequent murder of Tybalt moves the tragedy to its inexorable conclusion. Male violence is shown to infect all spheres of life in Shakespeare's Verona, from romantic love to the parent-child relationship. In the beginning, Romeo is depicted as a typical, unrequited Petrarchan lover. He is melodramatic, or over the top, self-consciously suffering because his love for Rosaline is not returned. The act of winning love is constructed using language forming a semantic field of battle. She'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow, she hath Diane's wit. And in strong proof of chastity, well armed, from love's weak childish bow she lives uncharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes. He may not be physically aggressive, but he is certainly emotionally aggressive. Male aggression and the total subordination of women is also apparent within the home, as we see Lord Capulet's violent words towards Juliet. Female children of noble families at this time were expected to marry men of their father's choosing, and Capulet is, as you would expect, outraged when Juliet apparently defies his desire for her to be married to Paris. Not only does he verbally attack her using grotesque epithets, out you green sickness carrion, out you baggage, you tallow face, and hang thee, young baggage, disobedient wretch. But he also threatens her with physical violence if her disobedience persists. But fettle your fine joints against Thursday next to go with Paris to St Peter's Church, or I will drag thee on a hurdle thither. Caplet's choice of the word hurdle here, which was a wooden frame on which traitors were dragged through the streets on their way to execution, demonstrates the level of outrage that he feels. In his eyes, Juliet is a traitor and deserves, therefore, the most violent treatment. He also declares that his fingers itch with the desire to strike her. Male coercive behaviour over their female relatives does not limit itself, however, to physical and verbal aggression, as Capulet also threatens her with being disowned and thrown out onto the street. Get thee to church a Thursday, or never after look me in the face. Women were completely at the mercy of the men in their families. 
Although male aggression and violence dominate Romeo and Juliet as it did Elizabethan England, Shakespeare cannot be said to glorify or even to approve of it. He demonstrates the damage that unfettered male aggression causes as violence is shown to breed violence, and by the end of the play, almost the whole of the next generation of Verona society has been wiped out, compromising its future. Shakespeare does, however, suggest that violence can be diminished through love and suffering. The fact that Montague and Capulet are able to hold hands at the end is an indication that their male aggression has been effectively extinguished through mutual tragedy. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.